Well, I believe I have something really awesome for everybody today. How many in here need healing in their body? All right, well, we're just going to say right now you're going to get it today. I'm just going to say that. Now, I'm not talking about healing today. That's not the main focus that I have, but I believe that we can apply that to healing today. And so whatever it is that you need healing from right now, it could be small and it can be big. I want you to envision God just putting healing in front of your face right now. And today, before we leave, you're just going to take it. Let's turn to Luke chapter 8. Or flip there or tap there if you have a phone. Luke chapter 8, verse 40. We're going to start there. I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard. Uh, You can put whatever you want up there. Luke 8, 40. Okay. Adolfo? <laughs> can you can you help me out? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, Luke ch- Luke chapter 8 verse 40. I'm going to start there. And as Jesus returned, the people welcomed him for they had all been waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, and that is pronounced correctly, I did look it up, it's Jairus. There came a man named Jairus, and he was an official of the synagogue, and he fell at Jesus' feet and began to implore him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. But as he went, Jesus, the crowds were pressing against him. And a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, Who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, for I was aware that power had gone out of me. When the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she she came trembling and fell down before Jesus and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I'm going to stop right there for now. And I'm going to pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for everything that you've done. God, And we thank you for being here with us. Your presence being in our midst. God, that is a blessing. That is a blessing for your presence to be here. And we thank you for that, Jesus. And we ask that today that eyes, ears, hearts would be open to what you want to say to us today, even if it's no words that come from my mouth. But God, speak something into every heart today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of paraphrase what we talked about or what we just read. So Jesus is walking through the city streets and... A bunch of people are crowding around him. And we hear about this man named Jairus who comes and starts begging Jesus to come to his house because his daughter's dying. Okay, he starts begging Jesus to come to his house because his daughter's dying. And then it says that he keeps, Jesus keeps going as people are pressing and crowding up against him. And then this woman who's had a hemorrhage for 12 years comes up and she thinks, if I can just touch his cloak, then I'll be healed. She thinks this, she feels this in her heart. And so she probably clamors up. She tries to get up to to Jesus as much as she can because all these people are crowding around him. And finally, I can just see her like laying on the ground and just reaching out and there's the tips of her fingers touching the cloak of Jesus. And when she did, she was immediately healed. And then it says that Jesus is like, hang on a second, somebody just touched me. And And the disciples that were with Jesus thought he was absolutely nuts because they're like, Everyone is touching you right now. What are you talking about? Everyone is touching you. You have so many people around you. How can you possibly know that one person specifically has touched you? And he said, I know that somebody touched me because somebody, because I felt the power go out of me. I felt power leave me. So I know somebody has touched me. And he turns around, he sees this woman and she understands, okay, well, I can't escape notice here. So I'll just go ahead and declare it. I touched Jesus I touched his cloak, and I was healed. She declares it so everybody can hear it. 
And then he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. <clears throat> now, I, I know that I have an interesting way of looking at things, but I'm going to give you one today, an interesting way to look at this story. You guys like looking at things interestingly? So Jesus noticed that somebody had touched him in the midst of all this chaos. Okay, there are people all around him touching him, shouting, probably talking to each other, talking to Jesus, touching him, crowding around him. There's probably a bunch of body heat and body odor that's just surrounding Jesus, okay? And somehow he feels this one person touch him. He feels this one woman touch him, okay? This is what I thought was interesting, This woman was healed, but Jesus didn't know it until it had already happened. Now, I don't want to take from the sovereignty of God today and say that God doesn't know what's going to happen before it happens because I believe that he does. But this woman had already been healed before Jesus said, somebody just touched me. Right? She had already been healed. It wasn't a thing where it's like she touches him and he turns around and says, be healed in, in the name of me. <laughs> okay, it wasn't one of those things. Nobody laughed at that except for like four people. <laughs> I'm, I always thought about that. What did Jesus say whenever he prayed? You know, like did he end it with in the name of me, amen? Or no. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. So this woman... <laughs> this woman touched Jesus and was healed, and Jesus didn't realize it until it had already happened. Because he said, I felt power go out of me. So we get the image that this woman actually took power from Jesus. Okay? Now, some of this might sound sacrilegious today. I want you to believe that. I believe God, I want you to know I believe God is sovereign. So anything I say today that might sound like it's taking away from his sovereignty, I want you to know that. I, I'm not meaning for it to sound that way. But she touches him, and she's healed, and he says, hang on a second. Hold on a second. This is what I thought was interesting about that. I believe, well, let me, let me say this first. Ultimately, we know it was the healing power of God that healed this woman, okay? It can only be the healing power of God that healed this woman. It couldn't have been anything else. Ultimately, we know it was the power of God that healed her, but Jesus was not responsible for her healing. Is that hitting anybody? It was the power of God that healed this woman, but Jesus was not responsible for her healing. And I can prove it to you. If that sounds sacrilegious, let me prove it to you. Jesus turns around and he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. He gave credit to her faith. He did not take credit for this healing. He gave credit to her faith. He said, it's because of your faith you've been made well. Go in peace. So we know it was the power of God that healed her, but Jesus was not responsible for this healing that had happened. The word says, to each has been given a measure of faith. All right? And to this woman, she had been given a measure of faith, and she was faithing responsibly. She was being responsible with her faith. I want you to ask yourself, are you responsible with your faith? You know, all the alcohol commercials, they say drink responsibly. Faith responsibly. <laughs> faith responsibly. That's what I want to say to you. I'll just make that the title of the message. How about that? That's going to be really confusing to people. Faith responsibly. Jesus was not responsible, and he clearly understands that because he turns around and he doesn't say, it's a good thing you touched me or you wouldn't have been healed. He turns around and says, your faith has made you well. He gives honor to her faith. He honors her faith in that moment. He gives credit to that. He said, this is, how, this is what was responsible for your healing. Your faith was responsible for your healing. So each has been given a measure of faith. If you've been given a measure of faith, then faith responsibly. Be responsible for, with your faith. Use it. Use your faith. This woman was responsible for God opening up his power to her in the way of healing. So if you need healing today, be responsible for your healing today. Be responsible with your faith. Here's the other thing I thought was interesting about this. I talked about how Jesus didn't realize that 
somebody had been healed until it already happened. It's like she was healed, and then all of a sudden he realizes that something caught him off guard. Okay, this woman's faith caught Jesus off guard. And I believe that the kind of faith that God wants us to have is the kind of faith that catches him off guard. Faith so big and so strong that we're already healed before Jesus can even turn around. Right? That's exactly what happened in here. That's the kind of faith that God wants us to have. Now, I'm, again, I'm not speaking against the sovereignty of God. I believe that he knows it's going to happen. He knows we're going to get healed before we get healed. But I believe that that's the kind of faith that he wants us to have. The kind of faith that makes him turn around when it's already happened and say, hold on a second. My son or my daughter was just healed. That's the kind of faith he wants us to have, the kind of faith that catches him off guard. Have the kind of faith that catches Jesus or God off guard. That's big faith. That is big faith. We want to have the kind of faith that catches Jesus by surprise. And that's part of being responsible with the measure of faith that's been given to us. Okay, if we are faithing responsibly, if we're being responsible with our faith then that's, that's really big faith. If we really are being responsible with our faith, it's, it's really big faith. So let's do that, okay? Can we agree that we're going we're gonna to be those kind of people? If you need healing today, I want, you to, I want you to feel that way. I want you to believe that. I want you to receive it today. The kind of faith that catches God off guard. All right. So he turns around and he says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I love that go in peace. He was saying, you don't have to worry anymore. Let your mind be free of all this, okay? Just, <laughs> you have nothing to worry about anymore. Yeah. You know, that's a good point, that he called her daughter, because that's exactly what she was being in that moment. Now, we can call ourselves all the time a son or a daughter of God and then continue to not live like one. And this woman was being a daughter. She was acting like a daughter. Okay, let's think about that. She was acting like a daughter. All right, in verse 49. While he was still speaking, go ahead and pull that up so I don't get ahead. Yeah. While he was still speaking, someone came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. So we already heard about Jairus. Now, there's a big difference between the woman with the hemorrhage and Jairus, all right? I thought it was interesting that we heard about Jairus before we heard about the woman, but Jairus' issue was not taken care of before the woman's issue was taken care of. I like the order of this, okay? We heard about Jairus before in verse 40. We heard about Jairus coming from his house because his daughter was dying. Okay, she was 12 years old and his daughter was dying and he came from his house and he began to beg Jesus to come to his house to heal his daughter. We heard about this before the woman, but the woman was healed before Jairus, Jairus' daughter was. And not only that, but Jesus responded to the woman before he responded to Jairus. There's a big difference between Jairus and the woman, and we're supposed to be like the woman. But I'm going to get more into that in just a second. So in verse 49, it says that someone from Jairus' house comes and says, Don't bother Jesus anymore. She's She's gone. It's over. There's no point. There's no point. Whatever it is that you need healing for today, if you have gotten to the point where you say it's too late, you are not faithing responsibly. Okay? So he comes from Jairus' house. He says, don't trouble Jesus anymore. She's gone. And then in verse 50, I love this. It says, but when Jesus heard this, and this is in italics in my Bible. I don't know what it looks like in yours. Is it in italics up there? Okay, it's different up there. But in my Bible, it says, when Jesus heard this, and the word this is in italics. So it's trying to emphasize that Jesus heard this. Does that mean that Jesus heard Jairus before? Probably. Jesus probably heard Jairus crying out to him before, saying, come to my house, I need your help, my daughter's dying. But then it says, but when Jesus heard this, when Jesus heard this, he answered him, do not be afraid any longer, only believe and she will be made well, or she will be healed. I love that it says, when Jesus heard this. 
Because to me, it implies that he heard Jairus before when Jairus was begging him to come to his house. And it's not that Jesus was ignoring Jairus, just saying, I don't need to worry about him. I think it's that Jesus understands that each has been given a measure of faith. And Jairus, if he had faith, would not be begging Jesus to come to his house, but would take what was there, just like the woman did. The woman who had the problem, she didn't beg Jesus to come to her. She went after Jesus. All right, and Jairus was begging Jesus to come to his house to heal his daughter. And the difference between Jairus and the woman is that Jairus needed Jesus to come to him, and the woman decided, I need to go to Jesus. There's a big difference there, okay? Something, something here to, to think about is a woman, the woman understands, she understood that the healing that she needed was already made available to her. To her. She just needed to reach out and take it. Jairus thought that the healing needed to come to him. It wasn't available to him yet. So whenever it says in verse 49, but when, or verse 50, but when Jesus heard this, there's something that happens here, okay? What Jesus heard when someone from Jairus' house came up and said, give up, don't bother Jesus anymore, she's gone. What Jesus heard was hopelessness, all right? What Jesus heard in that moment was hopelessness. And that's, why, that's what made him turn around. He's like, hold on a second. <laughs> now, I, I wanted Jairus to have faith before, but now it's just to the point of hopelessness, and I'm not going to tolerate this. We're not going to deal with this. So then when Jesus heard this statement of hopelessness, give up, stop bugging him, it's over, she's gone. When he heard this, he turns around and he says, don't be afraid anymore. All you got to do is believe, and she's going to be made well. Now, I want to say something about this. Religion, even religion, can look at someone who makes a hopeless statement and make them feel condemned for feeling hopeless. Like, I've encountered it all my life. When I, if I say something like, I'm just so tired, I don't think I can go on any longer, and somebody, a Christian nearby is like, don't you say that. Don't you dare say things like that. You know, it makes me feel condemned. It doesn't help me at all. And I want to encourage you guys, do not make people feel condemned for having a moment of weakness. All right? That's not the way. That is not compassion. All right? That's not compassion. Don't make people feel condemned for being human being. All right? For having a moment of weakness. We don't do that. Jesus turns around and he doesn't say, don't you dare say anything like that. He said, don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. I'm sure he had compassion in that moment. He understood. Right? Jairus just received news that his daughter is, is dead. And I'm not going to turn around and say, don't you dare talk like that. <laughs> he had compassion for the situation. He understood the situation. So let, let's get into the practice and into the habit. If you are in the habit of, of hammering too hard on people who are having a moment of weakness, let's get out of that, okay? And let's start having compassion. Now, there is a moment. There are moments when you need to say, get behind me, Satan, all right? But I, I guarantee you the moment for compassion is much more present than the moment for that. All right? We need to make sure we're treating people with love and compassion. All right. So the difference between Jairus and the woman is that Jairus wanted Jesus to come visit his problem, but the woman made her problem visit Jesus. All right? Jairus wanted Jesus to visit his problem, but the woman made her problem visit Jesus. How many of you in here have been making your problems have a visit with Jesus, or you've been waiting for Jesus to visit your problems, right? Ha making, taking control of your situation and, and having your problem and your issue or whatever you face and just being like, God, just here you go. <laughs> Deal with this. This is yours. I'm just going to give it to you. You know, you guys just do your thing, and I'm going to continue to live, all right? Most people, they just anguish. They live in anguish, and they live in fear, and they live in hopelessness, and they just drown in their situation and what their situation's doing to them because they're sitting there waiting on God to come and fix the problem. But the solution is not God coming to fix the problem. It's you giving the problem to God. All right? Bring the problem to him, and that's exactly what the woman did. She brought her problem to Jesus because she knew what Jesus had was made available to her because of her faith. And if we are waiting on God to come and fix our problem, we probably don't have the measure of faith that we should. The faith that we should, okay? So that's the difference between Jairus and the woman. 
So it says, when Jesus heard this, when he heard this statement of hopelessness in verse 50, do not be afraid any longer, only believe and she'll be made well. And then in verse 51, it says, when he came to the house, he didn't allow anyone to enter with him except for Peter and John and James and the girl's father and mother. Now they were all weeping and lamenting for her, but he said, stop weeping for she has not died but is asleep. Now let's stop there. So when he comes to the house, okay, when it says now they were all weeping, it's referring to a group of people outside who were, it was kind of like a funeral procession type thing. Okay, there was even music going on. They were lamenting, they were crying, and they were weeping over this girl who had just died. And they're all like surrounding the house outside the front door. And Jesus says, stop weeping. She's not dead. She's only asleep. And I think in Mark, the way Mark tells it, Jesus even says, go away. I mean, that's, he says leave in, in Mark, if you guys read that. He doesn't just say stop crying, he says leave. Jesus was doing something really interesting there, okay? These people outside the house, and the family even, lamenting and crying over this girl's death, they were operating in hopelessness. They had given up. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a definition of hopelessness, okay? And I want this to stick with you forever. Hopelessness is just a celebration of the enemy's victory. Hopelessness is a celebration of the enemy's victory. Hope is a celebration of God's victory, but hopelessness is a celebration of the enemy's victory. If you think about it that way, hopelessness becomes something you really understand. You need to fight back. You need to push back. It's not just time to cry. It's, it's a celebration of what the enemy has accomplished in your life because you're giving glory to it. You're dwelling on it. You're glorifying what the enemy has done by being like, there's no hope anymore. It's just done. We're done. We need to give up. It's a celebration of the enemy's victory. And Jesus did something really interesting. I love when it says in Mark, he says, leave, or he says, go away. He also says, stop weeping. He was doing something. He was taking charge of the atmosphere. He was taking charge of the atmosphere when he said, stop crying and leave. He was like, this is not going to be an atmosphere of hopelessness anymore. And if you can't stop crying, and if you can't have faith that I can accomplish this, that God can accomplish this, then I need you to leave. Because the atmosphere here needs to change. All right? All right. I was waiting for that to finish. So Jesus was taking charge of the atmosphere, and this is something I really need you guys to get, okay? He understood there was an atmosphere of hopelessness there and something needed to change. His first order of business was to change the atmosphere, to start changing some perspective. His first order of business was not to heal this girl. His first order of business was to change the atmosphere. Are you in charge of your atmosphere? Are you in charge of your atmosphere? Are you in charge of the atmosphere wherever you are? Are you in charge of it? Or are you allowing the enemy to be in charge of your atmosphere? Are you allowing everybody around you to be in charge of the atmosphere? Right now is a very critical time to understand this because of everything that's going on in our nation. Sure, maybe, you know, we have godly values present in the White House again, but right now there's a lot of strife and a lot of conflict and a lot of rage, hatred and anger going on in our country. And right now, more than ever, we need to understand what it means to be in charge of our atmosphere because you are going to encounter people who want to take charge of yours. You're going to encounter people who want to say things that just sound so negative and deadly and evil, and they're going to continue to say these things. They're, they, they even pray these things, thinking that they're praying the right way. And... You have to understand, when you encounter these people, you need to be the one that steps in and says, leave. Stop crying and leave. Now, I'm not saying go out and just be mean to people, all right? But if somebody is saying something, you understand is take, trying to take charge of the atmosphere, and it's not a godly atmosphere, you need to say, we are not going to talk like this. We're not going to do this. And if you need to separate yourself from certain people who are trying to control your atmosphere, then do it. All right? Jesus understood, yeah, I love all these people, but they're trying to take control of the atmosphere, so go away. Okay? The atmosphere he needs, here needs to be one of hope and one of faith. So he was taking charge. 
He says, stop weeping, leave, for she's not died, but she's asleep. He says she's asleep, but I guarantee you this girl had stopped breathing. I guarantee you this girl's heart had stopped beating. But Jesus says she's asleep. And then in 53, it says they began laughing at him, knowing that she had died. Okay, it says that they know she had died, so they obviously did some checks on her. Her pulse, had, she probably didn't have a pulse. She wasn't breathing. She probably lost a little bit of color. She was cold. So she, they know that she died, and that's why they started laughing at him when Jesus said that she was asleep. But here's the thing about Jesus. He's perfect, and he never lied. So whenever he said she was only asleep, he wasn't lying. But hold on a second. Her body was dead. It was lifeless. She wasn't breathing. Her heart wasn't beating. How could Jesus not be lying if he, if he said she was only asleep? Here's what I believe was going on in the moment. <laughs> Here's what I believe was going on in the moment. Jesus, okay, had a different perspective than all of these people did. His perspective was not how they saw it. All right? And whenever he saw this girl, he genuinely believed she was only asleep. I mean, he really believed it. He wasn't just spouting off stuff. He really believed this girl was only asleep. And he really believed, he genuinely believed she was only asleep because he genuinely believed that raising her from the dead would be as, easier, as easy as waking her up as if she were sleeping. So that's why he was making a statement of faith. She's only asleep because it doesn't take much because I have the perspective of heaven. And heaven looks at a situation like this and says it's as easy as waking her up. And if you think about waking up your kids when it's time for school, you just go and touch them, you know, or, you know, if they set their alarm now, it's one thing, but, you know, when they were kids, you go and just touch them, and they just wake up, it's time for school. My mom, whenever she would wake me up for school, I like, I like to, you know, when people, like, take the tips of their fingers and they just kind of run them along your skin or on the back of your head. That's what my mom would do. She would come in the room and she would just start running her fingers along my arm and, like, just kind of gently wake me up. And it got to the point where I was so addicted to it. <laughs> I was so addicted. Bailey doesn't do this to wake me up, okay? <laughs> but I was so addicted to it, it got to the point where she would just walk in the room and I would go. <laughs> and she's probably laughing right now. I think she's watching. <clears throat> but you see, it was just, it was just easy. She just, all she had to do was touch me. And so when Jesus was looking at this situation, he's like, she's only asleep because it's not going to take a whole lot to wake her up. I just got to go over and touch her. You see, that was heaven's perspective. He had heaven's perspective in that moment. When he said she was asleep, he saw this situation. It wasn't some massive mountain in his way. It wasn't some big, strong giant standing in front of him. It was just a little tiny thing. It was just a little thing. All I got to do is go over and touch her. And then it says that's what he did. He goes over, and I'm sure he sits down on the bed, probably takes her hand, starts to kind of pet it or something. And he probably says, like, wake up. He says, child, arise. But I can't, I don't know if he actually was like, arise, you know. But <laughs> we like to think about it that way. Arise, child. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's what he did. <laughs> He probably just like, wake up, you know, wake up. Yeah, he just tickled her arm, and she woke up. She was even doing this. <laughs> no, he just goes over and takes her hand, and she wakes up. After he says, wake up, she, she wakes up. It was that easy. You see, heaven's perspective, from up there, things look so small, okay? All of our problems, they look so small from up there. All of our situations, the big things that we face, they look so small. And if you think about the woman with the hemorrhage, she was seeing her problem as just a little tiny problem because she believed all she had to do was touch Jesus' clothes. Okay, that's, that's how she, she had heaven's perspective in that moment. All I got to do is cut, touch his clothes. That's it. You know, that's it. And she did, and she was immediately healed. See, from up there, everything looks so small. All of our problems, they look so small. 
But whenever we face him, sometimes we get that man perspective. We get that, the perspective of mankind that sees everything on the outside and sees what's going on. She's dead. This situation is dead. Let's give up right now. Okay, but that's man's perspective. Heaven doesn't see it that way. Man sees what's happening now, and heaven sees what can happen. Everybody get that? Man sees what is happening right now, and heaven sees what can happen or what is possible. So we got to start seeing what is possible. That's a measure of faith that we have to have. That's what it means to have faith and use it responsibly, to start seeing these things as little tiny issues, little tiny problems. It's a mindset. It's something in here that we have to change. And it's something right now that I believe is extremely crucial because though I believe that God is really doing some amazing things in our country and in the world, it's not over with the nonsense. The problems are not done. The fight is not over. And we have to be ready. When we walk into that battle and there's 50 of us and 5 million of the enemy's army, we see them as a little tiny issue because that's how heaven sees it. We have to have heaven's perspective right now. In Ephesians, it says that we are seated. We have joint seating with Jesus Christ in heavenly places. We have joint seating with him. And if we have joint seating with him, we should be seeing everything from the same point that he is seeing everything, as if we're sitting right next to him. How does Jesus see your problem? Because that's how he wants you to see your problems. How does Jesus see everything that's going on in America right now? Does he get hopeless about it? No. He genuinely believes America only has to wake up. That's how he believes. That's how he believes. So that's how we need to speak. That's how we need to pray. That's how we need to worship. We need to worship and pray as though God is still in control and as though God is still bigger than everything going on around us right now. And we need to learn to take control of the atmosphere that we are in. We need to learn to change the perspective of people around us. If we see that a perspective is not the way that it should be, say, no, let's get back in line here. This is how we're going to see things. You and I, as a body of Christ, are seated with Christ in heavenly places, so we need to start seeing the world from heavenly places. Right? Let's all stand. I'm going to the worship team come up here. Now, the reason I asked at the beginning if, if anyone needed healing today is because this can tie into this, okay? I, I believe that this was, we're supposed to have two altar calls today. I don't know how it's going to work. But the first altar call is if you need healing, and I know that our, our tradition is to, is to lay hands, and I believe in the laying on of hands, but I, t I believe that today God just simply wants you to make a symbolic representation that you are coming up to take what he has made available to you. If you need healing, make a symbolic representation right now and just come up here and, and believe right now. Believe, just reach out and take it just like the woman did as she reached out with everything that she had and she, all she believed she had to do was touch the hem of Jesus' garment and she would be immediately healed. That's all that she believed. So whatever it is that you're facing, whether it's big or small, I promise that God sees it a little tiny miniature. It's just a midget of a problem. Okay, it's just a tiny thing. It's just a little thing. And he, he's not overcome by it, and he's not afraid of it, and he's not worried about it. So reach out right now and take it. Just take it. Reach out and take it and believe in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God, whatever it is, I just pray for faith, and I pray for grace in each heart that has made a symbolic step toward their healing today. Whatever it is, God, I just want to believe that they don't have to walk out of here with it. In the name of Jesus, I want to believe that. That's the kind of faith that I have today. That whatever it is, physical or even spiritual or emotional, mental healing, whatever it is, just, I believe. Reach out and take it. Make your problem visit Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Life issues, life diseases right now, just because you were born with it doesn't mean you have to die with it. Just because you were born with it doesn't mean you have to die with it because you were born again. And when you were born again, you were born into a family that is diseaseless, that is without fear, that is without worry. So receive that right now. Become a son or a daughter this morning. Reach out and take your inheritance that Jesus died for, that he paid for. And believe. I'm just seeing a lot of things that people have struggled with for decades. And they think that it's something they just have to live with. It's something they just have to tolerate. Either mentally or even with medicine. You just have to tolerate. You just have to keep it at bay. But God doesn't believe in keeping it at bay. God believes in completely changing, transformation. He believes in taking away the bad and putting in the good. So let it be today. Whatever it is, if you've struggled with something for even decades today, that is not a big problem to God. That is something that he can just demolish in one, I'm just snapping his fingers like a magic trick. So have that kind of faith. Be responsible with it today and just reach out and take it. We receive it, God, in the name of Jesus. We receive the healing because we know it's been made available to us, God. We know that it's there. We know what kind of God you are. We know that you are capable. We know that you answer us. We know that you hear us, God. And we know that you have, been, you have made everything that we need available to us, God. You have put it into our laps. And if we would just reach down and take it and just start eating it and chomping on it a little bit, God, just I ask for that kind of faith in this house today. We receive it in the name of Jesus. I'm believing for testimonies of miracles. Testimonies of things that people thought were impossible. But if you truly believe that with God all things are possible, then I promise you this is possible. Thank you, Lord. Now something that this woman did after she realized that she wouldn't be able to escape notice, it says that she told everybody what happened. And so I want you to do that right now. Even if you feel like nothing physical has happened yet, you can't feel any physical difference, I want you to make a declaration with your mouth that you have been healed of whatever this is. Make a declaration with your mouth that you have been healed. Begin to transform the way your mind thinks about this situation that you're facing, this issue that you're facing. Begin to transform the way your mind thinks about it by speaking out what you know to be the truth in Christ Jesus today. You have been healed. Thank you, Jesus. And the second altar call we're going to do today, you guys can all stay up here, but the second one we're going to do is for anyone that needs their perspective to be changed. I believe right now, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say that this atmosphere right now is anointed for you to come up and receive a new perspective on how you're going to see things. And when you're surfing Facebook or you're surfing the internet and you're seeing all of the, the junk that's in the atmosphere right now, you're not going to be affected by it, but you're going to begin to affect your atmosphere if you want that, just come up here right now and receive it. You will not be affected by the atmosphere, but you will affect the atmosphere. If you want that, come up here and receive it. We fix our eyes on you, Jesus, and we change our perspective today. We take our rightful place next to your son, God, and we begin to see the way that he sees. 
God, if you have to remove scales from our eyes, God, of way, the ways that we've seen things in the past and ways that we're used to perceiving things, God, just begin to transform that. I just see God doing eye surgery. He's doing eye surgery. He's doing eye surgery. He's letting you see the way he's, you're supposed to see. Even your physical eyes, when you see a tree, you're not going to see vegetation, but you're going to see something that gives, it's giving glory to God. Even something as small as a rock, you're going to start seeing things differently. God, we receive your perspective in this house. We, we receive your heavenly perspective. We receive the way that you see things. We receive a life without fear. We receive a life without anxiety. We receive a life without doubt. God, we receive a life of grace. We receive a life of mercy. We receive a life of love and of hope. God, in any hopelessness, God, that we have operated in, God, let's just, just blow it out of here like a cloud. God, just move it out of here. Hopelessness and fear be gone in the name of Jesus. We're transforming transformation today for lives and for minds. Don't hang on to what you're used to, but get used to something else. In the name of Jesus, all, all the habitual thought processes just being broken right now. All habitual thought processes, things that lead from one thing to another and then all the way to the enemy's kingdom, just be broken right now in the name of Jesus. Even ways that we would respond emotionally to things, God. Those strongholds in our life, God, we, we just release that stronghold in the name of Jesus and we ask for Jesus to have a stronger hold on us than those things for your mind and your heart and your will, God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's just use the remainder of our time to just praise him. Let's just praise him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, you're so awesome.